Good morning, Barry Song friends and family. I'm glad to be here with you again on this third Sunday. This is my third attempt at recording this. Uh, every time I begin, some kind of loud noise happens around here, whether it be some siren, there's no bombs or anything going off, it's a test, or a helicopter taking off, so if I seem a little <laughs> frustrated, that's probably what it is. But um, I'm glad to be here with you, opening the Word in front of you today. I hope you'll join me as, uh, as I pray. Father in Heaven, thank you for giving us this opportunity to look into your Word in Christ's name. Amen. Some of you may be surprised to see me. Um, our arrangement had been I would come to you on the second Sunday of the month, and if there's a fifth Sunday, the fifth Sunday of the month. And I, and I want to take this opportunity to officially thank Jerry for coming and preaching for me five times. Um, I really appreciate the work that you did while I was gone. But what happened was, um, after last week's, or last month's sermon, there was some confusion, um, particularly concerning the relationship of the Christian to righteousness. And so, um, you know, con conversations were had, and um, instead of the confusion being clarified, it, in, some, in some minds, it actually... Um, it, 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 it did not. So, suffice it to say, I was um, comfortable with taking the third Sunday. So, what going forward, you're going to be hearing from me on the second Sunday and the third Sunday, and if there's a fifth Sunday, as there is in October, the fifth Sunday as well. Um, I want everybody to know there's no hard feelings uh, from me, and I don't believe from anybody in the church. And so, uh, we thank Jerry. And I'm grateful for his work in my absence. Well, with that being said, I wanted to take this first sermon to try to um, answer some of the questions surrounding any confusion that there might have been. I want to talk today about righteousness. Now, you could do an entire series, probably preach for an entire year, on different aspects of righteousness. But what I'm going to do today is um, if you're a note taker, this is where you need to break out the pen and the paper. I'm going to describe, um, and we're going to talk about it in terms of sanctification, okay? And, and that makes sense, right? Um, to be sanctified means to be set apart. And that's what righteousness is, right? That's what it is. That's what the Christian life is all about. And so, note takers, this is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about initial sanctification. We're going to talk about progressive sanctification, and we're going to talk about final sanctification. And uh, if you would prefer an acronym or an alliteration, uh, since we're talking about righteousness, which begins with an R, um, we're going to talk about it in these three ways. Rest, rumble, and realize. Rest, rumble, and and realize, and those three words correspond to the three main points. So let's talk first about initial sanctification, okay? Initial, I mean at the beginning. This is the rest um, aspect of righteousness. What we're talking about here is justification. Now, we're, there are all these big words, sanctification, justification, but here's what justification is. Justification is the Christian's judicial acceptance by God as not guilty because his sins are not counted against him. This is what we mean when we usually talk about a person getting saved. We say that God washes our sins away. We say that he throws them in the depths of the ocean. We say that he separates our sins as far from us as the East is from the West. Well, that's what justification is. One dictionary said, Justification is a deliverance from the penalty of sin and is a past action for all believers accomplished by Christ at the cross. Couldn't have said it better myself. 
when Jesus died on the cross, he accomplished the forgiveness of sins for all who would believe. And when we say the forgiveness of sins, we mean sins past, present, and future. So why am I using the word sanctify? Can we use the word sanctify when talking about getting saved? I thought there's a difference between sanctification and justification. Well, there is, but I want to argue that we can use the word sanctify um, if we're talking about an initial sanctification. Listen to this from the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, and verse 10, where the writer says, By that will, talking about the will of God, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now in that context, it is very clear that the writer of Hebrews is talking about our salvation. And yet he uses the word sanctified. And that's okay, because like I said, the word sanctified means set apart. It means to be made holy. And so everyone who believes in Christ's atoning work, what does God do for them? He justifies them without considering their works at all. In other words, He justifies them, He sanctifies them initially into the family of God. He separates them from sin, so to speak. With, not based on anything that they have done, but based on the work of of Jesus Christ. Here's just a couple of examples. I'm not going to read everything that I have on my sheet here. I could literally read for an hour. But from the book of Romans chapter 3, very very famous verse, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We know that one. What do the next two verses say? It says, and are justified by His grace as a gift. That is, you're justified, you are, you are counted righteous in the sight of God, not based on anything you've done. It's a gift. Four verses later, Paul writes, We hold, we believe, that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. And of course, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, By grace you have been saved through faith, this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. So justification, that is that initial sanctification, comes by faith alone. And when God justifies the sinner, He does not count their sin against them. That doesn't mean they're no longer a sinner. What it means is, well, I'll let Paul say it for us from Romans chapter 4, and verse 5, where Paul writes, To the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. As 2 Corinthians 5 says, that he who, be, he who knew no sin became sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God. And so that is what initial sanctification is. In theological terms, this is called judicial sanctification. That is to say that God, acting as our cosmic and our eternal judge, decides not to credit the sinner's sin against them, and instead credits the righteousness of Christ, the sinless Jesus, into their account. God says, Yes, you are a sinner, but I'm not going to hold you as guilty for your sin. You're not condemned. I won't send you to hell. I'm going to treat you as one of my children instead of as an enemy. Now, I'd like to illustrate this by using a marriage. Y'all know that my wife and I have been married well over 20 years now. That relationship formally began on May the 11th, 2002. Now, we had known each other for a couple of years before then, 
we got to know each other very well up until that point. But the marriage did not formally take place. We did not, the two become one until that day. Marriage begins with a ceremony. Before the ceremony, you are not married. After the ceremony, in which the most important piece are the vows that the man and the wife promise to one another before God and any witnesses, after that, the man and the wife are married. So, in the same way, justification, or what I'm calling initial sanctification, is like the marriage ceremony. It is the beginning point of a lifelong commitment to Christ. It is the beginning point of sanctification, of salvation. In other words, justification is the initial act of sanctification that God grants the sinner. God sanctifies the believer and sets them apart. What does he set them apart from? He sets them apart from sin, from condemnation, that is his judgment, and from hell, that sin brings. The forgiven Christian now has a relationship with God that is based not on their own righteousness, but the righteousness of Christ, and we rest in this. That is to say, I don't work for my salvation. I don't go to bed wracked with guilt and anxiety and nervousness or shame. Even if I've sinned that day, because I recognize and I rest in the justification that God has given me, that God has granted me. I rest, and you should too, in God's initial act of sanctification. God does this work. And so, it is at this point that we face a critical question. What happens after initial sanctification? What is our relationship to righteousness at that point? Are we made as righteous as we will ever be? Man, I hope, I hope not. I've got a long way to go, and I'm sure that you do, too. Another way of asking what is the Christian's relationship to righteousness is by phrasing it this way. What is the Christian's relationship to sin? And here's the answer. The answer is we make progress against sin. This is progressive sanctification. Initial sanctification is when we get saved. Progressive sanctification is where we spend the rest of our lives. One definition of progressive sanctification said that by contrast, that is with justification, with initial sanctification, progressive sanctification is the continual process by which God is actually making a person righteous. So in other words, God sets you apart, He sanctifies you, initially, and then for the rest of your life, God continues to sanctify you. He continues to make you righteous. As the Holy Spirit says through the Scripture, we are saved for good works. And there's a lot of different places I could read that, that prove that, but one of the best ones is Ephesians 2.10 which actually verses 8 and 9 says, we, by grace we are saved through faith. I just read that a moment ago. Um, this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Why did God create you? Why did God save you? Well, so that you might produce fruit, so that you might work for God. And of course, James chapter 2, verses 21 through 24, says this, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? 
You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Now, there's no disagreement in the scripture. All of scripture agrees. This is known as the perspicuity of scripture. Um, Paul agrees with James. James agrees with Paul. They're just looking at it from different angles. And here's, here's basically, this is a good line that you might want to write down if, if you're a note taker. Faith alone justifies. We are not saved by works, right? We're saved by faith alone. So faith alone justifies, but faith that justifies is never alone. In other words, faith that justifies will bring good works in its wake. And just like I said, the initial sanctification was a stage of rest. We rest in the sanctifying work of Christ, what he did for us on the cross. Um, this stage of progressive sanctification is where we rumble. I don't know how many of y'all remember the, uh, the hype man before some of these boxing events and later wrestling, but by Michael Buffer where he would say, let's get ready to rumble. Well, he was, he was saying, hey, there, a fight is about to happen and you should get excited about that. Well, we rumble against sin on a daily basis. Our fight is against sin. And might I add, if you're not fighting against sin, if it's not something that you're rumbling against on a daily basis, you might not have ever truly rested in the gospel. There's a million places we could go to to look at this point. But just look at the Sermon on the Mount as one example. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, for example, um, look at the Beatitudes. He says, this is how you should live. He says, be salt and be light. He says, hold your temper. Keep your temper. He says, hold your passions. Don't even look at somebody and lust after them. He says, keep your marriage. Don't divorce people. Don't divorce your spouse. He says, keep your word. Don't make rash vows that you can't keep. Keep your promises. And then he says, be perfect. And that's just chapter 5. <laughs> There's also chapter 6 and chapter 7. And all of that um, can be summed up with what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, where he wrote this. As he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. God sanctified us initially through the act of justification when we believed in Jesus Christ. And then for the rest of our lives, God sanctifies us and we, we rest in the initial sanctification while we rumble against sin and temptation. And, and I'd like to continue with the analogy of a marriage. A marriage, I said, begins when a man and woman take the vows. That's when they become one. But afterward, they spend the rest of that marriage becoming one. Any of you that have been married for any length of time can attest to the fact that just because you said vows to one another and you cut some cake does not mean that you automatically see eye to eye and you get along and the two become one. Yes, two become one on the marriage day and then you spend the rest of the marriage becoming one. Well, that's a, an apt analogy, I think. Initial sanctification, justification, getting saved is when God takes our sin places it on Christ at the cross, and he takes Christ's righteousness and puts it in our bank account. We didn't earn it, but we get it anyway. He sets us apart. And then for the rest of our lives, we work with God through the Holy Spirit, through the reading of Scripture, through prayer, 
to encouragement of believers, we rumble against sin, working towards greater sanctification. Now, imagine if you would, in a marriage, I'll use myself as an example, since I can't pick on anybody there. What if every time I annoy Natalie, or every time I hurt her feelings, instead of asking for forgiveness, I said, baby, I'm so glad that on May the 11th, 2002, we got married. I'm so thankful that we took those vows to one another and you will never divorce me and I'll never divorce you. Oh, baby, I'm so glad that that happened. It, how, how do you think she would respond to that? I mean, here I just said something very hurtful and I'm going back to May the 11th, 2002. No, yes, May the 11th, 2002 is the bedrock. It's the foundation of our relationship. But in day-to-day -day interaction, I still have to interact with her. I have to ask for forgiveness. I have to be there for her. I have to rumble, so to speak. So God does the work of initial sanctification. He justifies us outside of anything we can do. And then God also does the work of progressive sanctification. Trust me on this. Even though we rumble against sin, even though we work our tails off, we could still never defeat temptation and sin outside of the grace of God. Amen? God does this work. Now, there might be some really acute thinkers out there saying, Hey, this is irrational. This doesn't make sense. You're telling me that I'm made righteous, but I'm still a sinner. How does that work? That doesn't make sense. Well, I'm not asking you to believe anything irrational. I'm asking you to believe something that's biblical. You know, there are times when the Bible requires that we believe seemingly, and I say that, seemingly incompatible teachings. Here, here's a couple of examples. And uh, I'm not there to hear it, but I want to hear what your responses are, okay? Or I want you to respond out loud. How do you gain your life according to Jesus? You gain your life by losing it, right? Um, is God one or three? And the answer is, well, yes. <laughs> one God, three persons. Was God Jesus or man? Again, yes. 100% God, 100% man, one person, two natures. Are you righteous or are you a sinner? And again, this is not irrational. The answer is yes. From a heavenly perspective, from an eternal point of view... You have been granted, the believer has, God's judicial pardoning, that judicial sanctification, that initial sanctification. You have been set apart and clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But we don't live in the eternal yet. We live in the temporal. And from an earthly perspective, sin is still a part of us that we must kill every day. Now, this progressive sanctification takes place as long as you will live. It requires that we rest while we rumble. We rest in Christ and His righteousness while we rumble against sin and temptation. It's almost as if every morning when you wake up, last week I talked about setting your mind on things above. One of the things you could do is by thinking, I am going to rest in the righteousness of Christ today, and then you hear the voice of Michael Buffer. Now, let's get ready to rumble against sin in your own heart. Because every day that we wake up is a day that we battle sin, 
that we confess sin, that we repent of sin, that we ask forgiveness from other people, that we rejoice in the Lord and His forgiveness, that we have joy, that we go to sleep thanking Him for that forgiveness. The point is, if it sounds like a mess, it is, but that's okay because that's why it's called progressive sanctification. We make progress. Which leads us to the last point. Final sanctification. Initial sanctification, we rest in it. Progressive sanctification, we rumble against sin. Final sanctification, we realize total righteousness. Complete sinlessness. What we're talking about here is glorification. Uh, if you were going to look just at theological terms, then the first step, that initial sanctification, is what we would call justification. The second step, progressive sanctification, is what we normally call sanctification, uh, what I might call sanctification proper. And then the third step, the final sanctification, when God completely sanctifies us, there is no further step. That's what the Bible calls glorification. And that's when we don't have to rumble anymore. When the Bible speaks of glorification, there are... There's more than one piece to that. There's reigning with Christ. There's resurrection of the body. There's the final recreation of all things. But the part that I want to focus on is this realization of sinlessness. What we call sinless perfection. Something that we cannot achieve in this life, but God will do for us in the next. God will... Take, I don't know how he does it, but he's going to burn all the sin and even the desire to sin out of our lives. We won't even be able to be tempted in the afterlife. Um, look at this. In Romans chapter 28, I'm sorry, chapter 8, verses, verse 28, he says, We know that all things work together for good for those who love God and for those who are called according to his purpose. We all know that verse. There's actually verses after that as well. Here's what they say. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. Did you know that's your destiny? To be conformed perfectly to the image of his Son. When will that happen? Not in this life. It, it is happening. That's what progressive sanctification is. But the final realization of that is not until... We reach glory. That's why we call it glorification. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Now Paul uses the past tense, not because it's already happened, but because it's so certain that it, he may as well use the past tense to describe it. There are times when Scripture does that. There are times when the Old Testament prophets, speaking of a future that has not yet come, use the past tense. Why? Because they're so certain. It would be like me saying, man, the Eagles beat down the Cowboys so bad. Or the Cowboys beat down the Eagles so bad. That's this Sunday. That's the future. Well, this future concerns a sinlessness. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, it says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. When is the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ? Has it already happened? No, it's in the future. And of course, Revelation chapter 22, describing... Um, the future heaven says this, Outside are the dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. The point is, inside heaven, there are no sinners. One dictionary said glorification, I like this, glorification is the perfection of sanctification. Now, uh, I... Must admit, I really wanted to use the marriage analogy one more time, but I couldn't think of a way to do it because there is no such thing 
as a perfect marriage. But I did think of another analogy that might work. When you go to high school or college, well, let's use high school as an example. Everybody has that in common for the most part. You start in the first grade, you're just a little tyke, six years old, seven years old, however old you were, and you work all year, you do whatever it is, two plus two equals four, whatever it was you do in first grade. Then you go to second grade, you throw in some geography and some history. You go to third grade, you're getting smarter. Fourth, fifth, sixth, it seems like it takes forever. Of course, we all know looking back, it's a blink of an eye. But you finally get to your senior year, and you get through your finals, and you pass them all, and that day comes. When you sit out in the crowd, and they say, seniors, stand up, and you walk across, they call your name, and you walk across the platform, and the principal, the headmaster, whoever, hands you that sheet of paper, the coveted diploma. Glorification is our receiving the diploma with one key difference. Jesus did the work. Jesus did the work. We did not. We're not sanctified initially because of anything that we did. We're saved because of God, because of what Christ did. Even our progressive sanctification, yes, we work, but without God's sanctifying power through the Holy Spirit, there's no chance against sin. And then the final act all we do is die. Our, our big final event is to die. There's, there's no victory in that for us, except that Jesus already did the work for us. Jesus does the work and gives us the diploma. How amazing is that? So, as we, trend, uh, as we make transition to the conclusion, there are three distinct steps in the process that God calls salvation or sanctification. Step number one, initial sanctification or justification. That's, when we, that's where we rest, and that rest never ends. Step two, progressive sanctification. That's where we rumble against sin. And step three, final sanctification. That's where we realize sinless perfection. Now in this life, before we draw our final breath, the believer will experience the first two steps. Initial sanctification. When God pardons us of our sins and deposits Christ's righteousness into our account. What we call being born again or getting saved. And that leads to the second step. Progressive sanctification which is where we make progress in holiness and living like Jesus before God, or righteousness. God makes us righteous in the first step of initial sanctification, and in doing so gives us the motivation and the ability to progress in righteousness for the rest of our lives. But it's a battle. And finally, in the last step of sanctification, God had either our death or his second coming, whichever comes first, grants the believer complete release from sin, final sanctification. The battle is over. We can finally lay down our arms, no more rumble. We realize perfection. So what? What does any of this matter? Well, first of all, have you received God's gift of initial sanctification? Unbelievers are those who never have, by faith, believed in the atoning, saving work of Christ, that is, His death, burial, and resurrection. And I am 100% certain that there are some listening right now who need to receive initial sanctification. You need to be saved. Maybe that's you. You're still in your sins, and if nothing changes, you will be judged in your sins. God will condemn you in your sins, and you will go to hell 
That is not what God wants for you. God wants to take your sin, place it on Christ, and to take Christ's righteousness and to give it to you. God wants to declare you innocent, but there's only one way to do that, and that is to believe the gospel and to repent of your sins. You must receive initial sanctification. Will you do that today? Number two, are you resting while you rumble? That is to say that in your fight against sin, first of all, are you rumbling? Some people uh, have chosen not to rumble that much against their sin. They choose to imbibe it. They choose to live with it. They choose to make peace with it. And the Bible is very clear. The Christian is a person who makes war against their flesh, against the principle of sin that lives in them. We make war against temptation. We make war against the sin which so easily besets us. And so, I probably shouldn't do this, but I'm taking for granted that you are rumbling against your sin. Can I say this? If you're not, you probably aren't saved. But assuming that you are rumbling against your sin, you are fighting it, you are trying to make progressive you are trying to progress in your sanctification. Can I encourage you? I implore you, rest in the righteousness of Christ while you do that. One of the areas that Satan can trip us up is after we're saved, while we, we, we want to be righteous, we want to please God, he will sidle up to us after we've sinned and whisper in our ear, you aren't good enough for God. God would never truly forgive you. Why? Because we understand we understand that holiness is a big deal, but what Satan is depriving you of in that moment is your rest in what Christ did for you. God will never condemn you because of any sin that you commit if you are resting in Christ. So we rest while we rumble. Again, remember, there's that dichotomy. That doesn't make rational sense. But again, the Scripture many times asks us to compartmentalize and to put things side by side that seemingly don't coexist, but they do. In fact, the only way you can truly conquer sin, the only way you can truly make progress in your sanctification is to begin by resting in Christ. Number three. Look forward to your reward. God, one day, will release you from the burden of sin. And not just the burden of sin, but all of the effects of sin. Creaky knees, wheezy breath, dim eyesight. Don't, be, don't bemoan the fact that this life is hard. Some of you worry so much about the effects of sin, broken relationships, broken body, broken politics, broken financial markets. Guys, all of this is temporary. One day, because of what Christ did for you at the cross, God will give you sinless perfection and all that that brings. No more broken bodies. No more broken financial markets. No more broken political systems. Jesus will reign perfectly and supremely. You will have a glorified body. We will reign with Christ. All will be well. Like Jesus says in the book of Revelation, Behold, I make all things new. Don't worry about what's going on around you. Your reward is coming. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, I pray that we would recognize what our relationship to righteousness is. We are made righteous. We are becoming even more righteous. And one day, you will make us completely righteous. I pray that this message would reach the ears and the heart of each hearer as it needs. And that they would respond in obedience as the Holy Spirit directs in Jesus' name.
la vivencia.